I think that if you're going to do anything that has a historical context, it only has value if it's talking about the moment we are in now. If it just feels like something steeped in mothballs, you know, that, that doesn't do any, you know, I, I don't want to see it, um, I don't want to be in it. But if, you know, Selma, in terms of voting rights and the erosion of voting rights in this country, there's a reason to tell that story again. Looking at your body of work, I'm just so impressed at how many different types of roles that you've chosen. But there's one theme that I've noticed through quite a few of them, whether it is Lightning Little and Red Tails, Tuskegee Airmen, or it's King Surratt's Comma in a United Kingdom, or Ira Clark, Union Soldier in Lincoln, or Dr. Martin Luther King. Wow, you've done and, your homework. <laughs> and, and Selma. <laughs> That's what I'm here to do. It's that. So many of your characters have a sense of nobility about them, have a sense of goodness and virtue. Are you attracted to characters that have an innate sense of nobility? Uh, well, clearly. Um, um, yes, I, I am. And uh, I think partly because, uh, f for me personally, I'm, I'm drawn to characters that are indicative of what I know to be true of the black experience. And um, uh, in cinema, I, I've seen a lot of the black experience that is ignoble. Um, and that's not to say that that isn't part of the black experience. Um, personally, I feel a need to redress the balance of, of some of what I have seen and, 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 and a lot of what I know to be true um, as, a, as a man myself, as a person of African descent, as a person uh, who has been raised by parents who are very self-possessed uh, in terms of who they are. And so I think, yes, I, I am drawn to those characters because, um, <laughs> you know, I... I recognize in them something that I know is within me, which is a pride about who I am as, as a man, as a husband, as a father, as a black man, as, as someone who um, really, you know, feels very strongly about making the world in which we inhabit a better place. And so, uh, you know, characters who do that in small and big ways are definitely uh, uh, characters that I, that I uh, find myself drawn to. Now, if you have a noble bearing so often in your films, it's no accident because, of course, you are, in fact, Yoruba royalty. You're descended from Yoruba royalty. How did you come to learn about your regal heritage? <laughs> My dad would love you so much right now. <laughs> My regal heritage. I had this man knows what he's talking about. Too. Um, Send him this video. <laughs> um, you know what? I, I grew up in the UK, and uh, you know our reference for what it is to be of royalty is the Queen. So you know when when you're growing up in Balham, uh, South <laughs> South London, and your dad tells you, "Ah, we are royal to you." Uh, you, you, you're thinking, uh, I can't see much correlation between <laughs> the Queen and our council estate uh, on Flowersmead Road <laughs> in Tooting Beck. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, one of the, one of the things my, my, my dad, when, you know, my dad has tribal marks. He has uh, four tribal marks on his cheeks and he has the, the word Bale written across his stomach. Bale means king. Um, my grandfather was uh, the king of a part of uh, o the Oyo lands called Awe. And, and, uh, and basically, the reason you have the tribal marks is traditionally, if you got killed in war, they need to give you a royal burial. Um, but my dad told me he had fought a tiger, <laughs> uh, which, is, which is why he had the tribal marks. <laughs> and being all of five and six years old, <laughs> that's a cool story. <laughs> And uh, it really helps if anyone's going to try and mess with you at school. 
And when my dad came to pick me up, there they were. Evidently, the tiger marks were right there. Um, so, you know, when, when, when he, he told me that we were of, of royal lineage, and I was like, okay, that's cool. And then we, we moved back to uh, Lagos in uh, 82. And, um, and I remember getting off the plane, and a bunch of my uncles were there, and thinking, whoa, like, everyone has fought a tiger. <laughs> um, <laughs> with all my uncles had this same tribal mark. So I was like, so daddy, uh, what? I was just joking with you now. I was like, what? Oh, my, my whole world is crumbling. I'm like, what, you, you didn't fight a tiger? So that, so I had, so, so that was very confusing. And then we, so we left the airport and then we arrived at this compound in, in Lagos on Oyelowo Street. So I was like, oh, okay, so, okay, so, so, it was, uh, the, the Tigers was sketchy, but we do live <laughs> on Oyelowo Street, and we're in this compound. So, and so it was this weird kind of myth-making slash reality. I mean, you know, Oyelowo means a king deserves respect. And so, you know, people would recognize that that's what the name means. And so, you know, all that to say is the residue of that is... You, you know, you told that you have a regal bearing enough and you're from a royal family enough, eh, stuff sticks. <laughs> um, uh, so, 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 yes, I, I walk around like a king, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. So you, so you lived in, in Lagos until your teen years and then you moved back to London and you said something to NPR that I thought was really interesting, that you said that learning about your royal heritage gave you a sense of self that has enabled you, as you've gone into your life in the West, to carry yourself in a way that flies in the face of the world. What did you mean by that? F flying in the face of the world, you know, that, that I, w I would swap, if indeed that's what I said, I would swap the world, <laughs> I'm sure that's what I said. Um, it's a good quote. I, I, um, Flying the face in the face of prejudice, I think, is, is what I meant by that. And what I mean by that is there is a real difference between growing up in a society where you are the majority as opposed to a minority. And, um, you know, I often, you know, I, I call it the Sidney Poitier syndrome, um, which is, you know, why, how he achieved what he achieved, the way he did at the time he did, I think is absolutely linked to the fact that he grew up in a society where he didn't have a minority mentality. Every opportunity on offer in the community he grew up in was his for the taking. And I think that has a bearing on how you get out of bed every morning. And if you, like me, uh, grow up in a society where you are part of the majority from the age of six to 13, you know, every opportunity on offer in Nigeria at that time was mine for the taking. And I do think it would have been different if I'd grown up in the UK through those formative years or in the US because I would be a minority. I am a minority. And there are opportunities, whether we like it or not, that are not as readily afforded me without me having to fight harder for them in both a European context and uh, an American context. And that's, you know, that's not to say that things aren't achievable. It just means that you are in a boxer stance every day, as opposed to being in a state of relaxation that enables anyone who's done anything artistic, anything to do with sports, anything to do with music, anything to do in life, being in a relaxed state is what enables you to achieve your optimal self. And if you're not in a relaxed state, you're holding. And when you're holding, there are ch the, the chances of hurting yourself, I think, are greater. And so basically, that's my best way of being able to explain what was sewn into me in that time living in Nigeria. And it stuck to the point whereby when I then experienced prejudice uh, in all you know, sorts of forms, going back to the UK or even now having lived in America for, for 10 years, I, I spot it very early and I'm able to approach it in a relaxed stance, knowing that to my mind, 
you are either going to have to come to terms with the fact that I am going to either join you or walk through you to get to where I need to get to. <laughs> And, and, uh, and, and that's just the disposition I have. It's just natural for me, um, as opposed to it being something combative that I think can sometimes be repellent. So you're a teenager in London. That's, it's amazing, by the way. That's you know, an incredible way of looking at the world and, and carrying yourself within it. And, and you know, thinking about then, so you had those formative years in Nigeria you're back in London now as a teenager. How did you get involved in acting? Oh, it was a girl. It was a girl. <laughs> it's always a girl. Um, I became obsessed with my pastor's daughter. Um, <laughs> it's true. Do tell. It's true. She would work the overhead projector, not, not unlike a situation like this. She always sat in about, about where you are. You're, s <laughs> you're very lovely. You're going to be her for now. Um, and I would always be further back uh, with my parents, pretending to listen to the sermon. And um, she just had this hair that just flowed in a certain way and sat on her shoulders in a certain Excuse me, I'm just having a moment. No. Uh, <laughs> And one day, she, uh, you know, my, it was like all my prayers got answered. She, 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 I remember it, so, it was, I can see it in slow motion. She turned around, walked down the aisle, came up to me and said, do you want to go to the theater? And, um, and I thought, oh my goodness, you are real, Lord. Um, and, uh, and so I remember the day I took a pink rose from my mom's garden, met her at Finsbury Park tube station, and, and as I was walking up to her with this rose in my hand, she gave me a look that clearly stated that I had misconstrued the situation. So I dropped the rose, walked up to her. She turned away from me on the escalator. I was dying as I was like, oh, Lord, this is, uh, where are we going? Um, and we turned up at the National Theatre. And, uh, and I thought, okay, let's, let's go and see this play. And then we went to the stage door instead of through the front doors. We went up these back stairs and we went into a rehearsal room where a bunch of teenagers were warming up for what I now know to be warming up. I've never seen teenagers warming up for, for a, a theater club. And I, I, I don't know if there are any actors here, but actors warming up. It's <laughs> and I thought she'd take me to a cult. So uh, <laughs> a secret cult that she hadn't told her dad about that she now was trying to indoctrinate me into. And, um, and, uh, and it was a youth, youth theatre group at the National Theatre. And uh, this was something I would never go to. I was a pretty shy kid. This was when I was about 15. Um, but I liked her enough that I kept on going. And there was a play that we were meant to be doing um, at the National Theatre. And there was a, a, a tube strike on this particular day. This, I, I kept on going because I was obsessed with this girl. Um, and uh, this tube strike meant that the three guys who were being groomed to play the lead didn't turn up. And so the director says to me, uh, 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 you, the quiet one, um, <laughs> just, just, re just read the lines just so that we can keep the rehearsal going. And I'd clearly been observing them thinking, how, how would I do it if I was ever going to do it? And so I just did it that way. And then so I did this. There was a speech that the, the, the lead character had. And I did it. And everyone just went completely stone quiet. I thought, oh, that's <laughs> I've murdered the speech. It's so terrible. And then a week later, I was cast as the lead. Um, so, you know, my very first thing I ever did was on the Cottesloe stage at the Royal National Theatre, Overachiever. I know you're thinking it. I know you're thinking it. Um, so, and that's where I, I sort of caught the bug. So, I mean, was that like the moment that you were truly hooked? Or was it like later on that you're like, I know now that this is what I want to do? for the rest of my life. I initially, it was just a lot of fun. I mean, you know, it really was. But, you know, uh, coming from Nigerian parents, the idea of doing anything for a living that is to do with the arts is just ridiculous. <laughs> um, that is not a proper job. You know, that, that's what you... So, so I couldn't, I, you know, it, it didn't even enter my head that this would be something I would do for a living. Um, but I, I loved it so much that I took it as an A-level 
And I had a teacher uh, called Jill Foster who um, really was so wonderful to me. And I, and I had... I had finished my A levels and I was uh, uh, I had got into Oxford Brookes University. I was going to do a law degree, which is exactly what my dad wanted me to do. And uh, a lot of tube stations. She stopped me outside Holloway tube station. I, I I I was I was in. It was the summer break, and she said, "David, I wouldn't say this to everyone who I've taught, but I truly think that you could you could do this for a living." And she helped me secretly um, <laughs> from my dad uh, apply for drama school. And I got uh, I got a scholarship to go to Lambda, and uh, I'd, I'd got into Oxford Brookes University. So I was like, so I said to my says my dad, uh, so Daddy, uh, I've 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 got into drama school, uh, drama sc <laughs> drama what? <laughs> and and then very quickly because I know my dad well, I said, and I've got a scholarship. Went, ah, scholar. <laughs> Uh -huh. We can tell everybody back home, my son, the scholar. Uh -huh. oh, yeah, oh. So, basically, that's what got me, uh, enabled me to go to drama school, is that my dad could tell all my uncles I was a scholar somewhere. And, uh, and, it, and it just kept going. And so I did three years at Lambda, ended up being at the Royal Shakespeare Company for three years, then did a show called Spooks. Uh, it's called MI5 here for three years, and it, and it just kept on going. It's the most incredible thing, and you know, I think the thing that I love about your career is that yes, you can do Shakespeare, you can be Henry the Sixth with the Royal Shakespeare Company, you can be a fellow like you are currently with the New York Theatre Workshop, but you're also drawn to genre films as well. You know, you've done Rise of the Planet of the Apes, you were in Interstellar, you voice the character Agent Callus on Star Wars Rebels, which I love. One for uh, the kids. I'm. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm one of the kids, and I'm, I'm, I'm a super fan. Uh, <laughs> I, my I have kids my are 15 <laughs> down to 5. You're one of the kids? You, you, you watch Star Wars Rebels? I do. I have my iTunes season pass. Okay. <laughs> but I, I'm curious. So I've always wondered about this, because you follow a long tradition of actors like Patrick Stewart, Ian McKellen, Lawrence Olivier, Kenneth Branagh, who've done Shakespeare but also sci-fi, fantasy, comic book films. What do you think is the overlap between like for, Shakespeare, uh, for Shakespearean actors and genre stories? Well, firstly, I, you know, I'm, I'm almost certain with all of those actors, um, well, certainly some of them. I, you know, I, 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 know, I know Ken a bit, and he, of course, loves... Yes, I did call him Ken. <laughs> Um, he, 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 of course, loves Shakespeare, but I think, you know, he, as you can see in, in what he's doing as a director, just loves storytelling. And, and, you know, that's the thing for me. I'm just drawn to great stories, great characters, and the opportunity to work with great people. And, um, you know, I could never had predicted that I would get to play great, you know, Shakespearean roles at the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and... To be perfectly frank, <coughs> what happened after I played Henry VI at the Royal Shakespeare Company, people, I remember reading uh, an article that described me as the Black Olivier. And, and as lovely as that is, that just made me want to run for the hills. <laughs> because I just thought, okay, they're, they're trying already to box me. I'm, right, well, I'm going to be the Black Mel Gibson. You know what? I'm just going to be Mel Gibson. You know, I'm just going to be David A. Yellow. That's what I went. You know, I remember, I remember, you know, just seeing that on the page and going, as lovely as that is, you've got to keep ringing the changes. And um, so, you know, I, I, you know, playing Othello as I am right now, I haven't done a play for 10 years. The, the other thing about theatre is that, and Shakespeare specifically, is that is the Everest, as far as I'm concerned, of acting. You know, if you can conquer that, and you never truly get to the place where you go, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've done my Othello. That's, <laughs> that's definitive. Let me uh, throw my crown down and just keep it moving. You never get to the point where that's the case. 
Um, but if you can get to the point where just to get the lines out in a way that the audience know what you're saying, by the time you get to film, you really do have a muscle memory for what it feels like to portray a three-dimensional human being in a way that equips you, I think, more so than if you didn't have that within you. So, you know, uh, it's for me, doing Shakespeare, doing theater is going back to school every time, and it really lends itself. I mean, you know, playing Dr. King, doing those speeches, playing someone as complex as him is absolutely rooted in, in you know, what you get to do playing Henry VI. So. Completely. And, you know, it, it's, it's, this is the first time that you've ever played Othello. Why was right now the right moment, do you think? Yeah, I've avoided it. I mean, I've, I've, I've been offered it before, and um, I hope that doesn't sound conceited, um, <laughs> but I had. And... Uh, <laughs> And, uh, and, and I'd avoided it because it just feels a bit obvious. It's a black Shakespearean guy. You know, I'm black, okay, David E. Eloge should play that. You know, I, I, give me Macbeth, give me Henry V, give me Coriolanus. But there was something about Sam Gold, who's, you know, who's directing it, and Daniel Craig playing Iago, and what, when we sat down to talk about it, and you know, I, I I rejected it initially. I said, yeah, I'm not doing that. Um, and Barbara Broccoli is a very persuasive woman. And, um, but, you know, sitting down with Sam Gold, what I, what I wanted to actually, when I looked at the play, I thought of Barack Obama. And I thought of the fact that this is a man who's been president for eight years in a country where there are people who are still shocked that that happened. Um, and uh, upset that that happened. And a man who, in my opinion, has been celebrated for his indisputable talent, but derided for his color uh, in relation to the office that he's held. And that's exactly the case with Othello. You know, the, the, this, this society within which Othello is functioning needs Othello because he's such a talented warrior but he's derided for his color. And that is basically the mossy sort of ground that Iago is able to infiltrate and turn this man in on himself. And the fact that we're doing it as a contemporary production, I just felt like it's the right time. I, 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 feel, I feel and I felt like there was now something to be said with this 400-year-old play now. And so, and the roles I do I think that if you're going to do anything that has a historical context, it only has value if it's talking about the moment we are in now. If it just feels like something steeped in mothballs, you know, that, that doesn't do any, you know, I, I don't want to see it, um, I don't want to be in it. But if, you know, Selma, in terms of voting rights and the erosion of voting rights in this country, there's a reason to tell that story again. You know, a United Kingdom, in relation to the fact that, you know, Suretse Karma and Ruth Williams um, fell in love outside of the notions of their race 70 years ago, and it's deemed radical what they did, but there are still people now who find that it an anathema. Uh, if that, that, you know, so that's something to talk about, you know, it's something to say about, okay, how far have we really come? So that's what I'm drawn to is, you know, things that, uh, and, and if it's a sci-fi film or what, you know, it's got to have a brain to it for me personally um, in order for it to, anything that's going to take me away from my kids for a moment <laughs> has to be of value. Uh, so that's the barometer for me. So I think the film actually where I first really took notice and just thought, wow, this is an incredible actor who's going to be just a major, major star was actually George Lucas's Red Tails. And that film was so amazing because your character was, was so moving to me in that. And, and that's a film that I feel like is really kind of, is really underrated because not only was that where I first discovered you in many ways, but also um, that's a film that uh, served as a career stepping stone for Nate Parker. It was one of the first films for Michael B. Jordan after he'd done a lot of TV, TV work. And I'm just wondering, you know, I know you developed a relationship with George Lucas out of that. What did you learn from Lucas? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I learned about tenacity 
um, because no one wanted to make that film. Uh, he had to spend his own money to make it. And, you know, arguably the most successful producer, maybe even director ever, you know, in relation to the Star Wars franchise. And, you know, the reason he was obsessed with telling the Red Tails story was that those dogfights um, that the, the Red Tails engaged in were the inspiration for the, the, the aeronautic battles you see in Star Wars. That's what he watched, and that was the inspiration. So he wanted to tell their story. Um, and I learned a lot from watching George and his shock and indignation at how that film was treated both before and after it was made. He was genuinely shocked that, you know, people weren't beating down the door to distribute a George Lucas movie that he had already paid to, to make. And I think that um, there is a very complex and complicated relationship with black heroism in cinema. Um, and I think that that, uh, you know, I know it, I know it to be true, um, and I felt it palpably doing that film, because you combine George Lucas, CGI, war heroes, you know, I mean, there's just nothing about that, in my opinion, that shouldn't make, you know, you lean in in a way that just goes, let's go do this. And I, I remember, you know, having several conversations with him going, I just cannot believe how tough this is proving to be. It's 25 years that was a dream project of his um, to get made. And um, it, it goes on. You know, I think, you know, it's still, it's still a challenge to have films be made that go beyond a long, a long and, in my opinion, painful narrative of um, how black life is boxed into a browbeaten state. Um, and, you know, I, I am just looking forward to the moment where black heroism, black leadership, people of color, women's leadership is trumpeted in a way that I've seen um, in, you know, in white male, the white male narrative, which is perpetual and is the status quo. And so the films I do, unashamedly, are about beating that drum. And I, I, and I won't stop until someone somewhere goes, okay, <laughs> enough, <laughs> come on in. Um, so, you know, and that, that's, that's what, that's, that's what, uh, you know, keeps me going. So then you just all, you completely blew our minds in Selma. I mean, the most incredible performance. You told the AV Club around the time that Selma came out in 2014 that in order to play Dr. Martin Luther King, it had to be a being of him not just a doing of him. W what did you mean by that? I had an incredible, uh, uh, I had two amazing opportunities th in the lead up to, to playing Dr. King in Selma, which was doing uh, The Last King of Scotland with Forrest Whitaker um, and, and doing Lincoln with uh, Daniel Day-Lewis. And in both of those films, I saw firsthand the price you must play uh, must pay, I should say, to play that kind of role. And um, the first time was with Forrest, and I was a bit cynical about it because I was like, mm, method acting. Mm. <laughs> um, and, uh, and also because it was a little scary. I mean, Forrest was playing uh, a Ugandan dictator. And I remember, you know, being in the hotel in Uganda, you know, saying, hi, Forrest, and him going, <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought, What's, what's his problem? <laughs> I'm and, and he stayed in character the whole time as the Ugandan, ask his wife, people. <laughs> um, and uh, 
But you can't deny the results. You know, you watch that movie and you go, okay, I'll, I'll, take, I'll take the weird grunting in the hotel uh, if you're going to do that. Um, and then, you know, I had developed more as, a, as an actor and then I had the opportunity to, to witness uh, Daniel Day-Lewis also, who, who was in, in, in character the whole time. And, and this was, you know, uh, Salma was a seven-year journey for me where I felt very called to do it into into that I'm a Christian and I I had you know read the script and I had prayed and I had felt God tell me on the 24th of July 2007 I was going to play this role and um the first director was going to direct it said literally that the feedback from my audition was David Yellow is not Dr King well I was like well God says I am so <laughs> so we'll have to see about that one um so, um, but, you know, all that to say, it was a long journey to when I actually got to play Dr. King. And so this was a formative moment for me. The scene, if you see the scene that I have with Daniel Day-Lewis, it's one day of shooting. And I, 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 I cannot put into words what it was like to be in his presence. You could feel all the work all the way, you could see, feel that a shift in his spirit had occurred in order for him to be able to do what he did. You could feel that he had been taken over. You could feel that this is the absolute zenith of what it is to be an actor. This is celestial, what I'm experiencing right now. To the point whereby, okay, so I'm going to tell a story that I haven't told in public before. Steven Spielberg, if you're listening, look, don't judge me. Listen. <laughs> So on that set, on that set, you weren't, everything had to be from like 1865. So like literally we are wearing underwear that's a bit hessian and scratchy. <laughs> um, and so you're not allowed to be on that set with anything contemporary. And I had forgotten my phone in my pocket. Okay, it didn't ring, it didn't ring, don't worry. But this is how amazing Daniel Day-Lewis was. I got into his hemisphere, and I felt like that phone was burning a hole <laughs> in my... Because I just thought, something is false. Something... I'm... Oh, I, I can't be in his presence. This is, I have a phone, and he's, like, literally Abraham Lincoln right now. Um, so... Um, that, I'm, but I, I, I jest, but it was, it was palpable for me, and that was the blueprint. And that was the point beyond which I was like, okay, if I, if I ever get this opportunity, I'm gonna have to do that. I'm gonna have to be, and I was, I, I stayed in character for, for the three months we, we shot, and um, it, it makes a difference. But it's so much better to, if you're a woman, to be married to someone playing Dr. Martin Luther King rather than Idi Amin. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, You'll it's like... You have to ask my wife yeah. about that. <laughs> um, How was that for her? Well, I had to gain a few pounds um, and, and not good pounds. <laughs> so, you know, that was different. You know, it was... <laughs> So, so I had to, I, you know, I had to gain 30 pounds and, and, quite, and, quite, and quite quickly. And, you know, when my kids were the problem. So I, I, I gained this grunting sound when I went to pick anything up. You know, like now I can just, I can do that. When you suddenly go there, you go, and, uh, <laughs> and it's completely involuntary. And my kids, had this song, this Jamaican song called Hey Fatty Bum Bum, <laughs> Sweet Sugar Dumpling. And every time I came in the room, my son would go, Hey Fatty Bum Not great for self esteem. Um, but no, for my wife, I remember one day, I was, we were moving house while we were doing Selma. And, uh, and she called me, and it was about curtains. You know, should we go for the gray <laughs> curtains or the brown curtains? And I went, well, I think we should. And she went, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> I, ca I can't talk curtains with Dr. King. <laughs> and I said, well, uh, we, we, we better pick this up in a, in a little bit. Uh, so so, so, so um, the curtains had to wait. That was as bad as it got, I think, for, 
for my wife. But I will tell you, I did have some freaky moments. I had a, I had a moment in Atlanta when we were shooting where I, I, I was staying in this house on my own. My kids weren't with me at the time. My wife, they, they were back in LA. And I was brushing my teeth. And I looked in the mirror, and I couldn't see myself anymore. And it, was a, and, it, and it was a very, it's a hard thing to talk about without it sort of sounding weird, because it was weird. I, I looked at myself, and I, and, I, and I, it was like, I don't know if you ever have that thing where you wake up in the morning, it, may t- it takes a moment for your eyes to adjust. And, uh, and it was like that. I couldn't, I couldn't find myself. And I kept on looking, kept on looking, and all I could see was this sort of Dr. Kingness. And I had to leave the room because it completely freaked me out. I didn't like how it felt. And then the other thing like that that was a little weird that happened was that, you know, the culmination of the film is me giving this speech in Montgomery. And Dr. King had been told severally that if he made that speech, he would be killed. Um, and and, and the, if you go to, and we went to the exact same place where that speech was given, and you can see that the, the, pl- the myriad of places where a sniper could take him out would... And I remember the day before doing that scene, I was absolutely convinced I was going to be killed <laughs> doing that scene. And, uh, and to the point where I, just, I only just stopped short of, of saying, can we sweep the buildings? Because I, I knew I'd sound like I was crazy. And then the day after we shot that scene, I was genuinely shocked I was still alive. And, and that was kind of like, okay, yikes. You know, we're, we are... We're in now, but again, I do think, I do think that's the price that you should play if you're going to get that kind of opportunity. David, it's been a pleasure. Thank Thank you. you.